QuickBooks Online Deposit Form. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. We're going to be using the free QuickBooks Online Test Drive searching in our search engine for QuickBooks Online Test Drive choosing the option that has Intuit.com in it, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. We will be using the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Zooming in a bit by holding down control up on the scroll wheel, currently at 125% zoom in. Noting that if I hit the cog drop down, we're currently in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We're going to be duplicating some tabs to put our reports in as we've done every time. Right click on the tab to duplicate it. Right click in the tab again to duplicate it again. Tab to the left as the tab to the right is thinking. We're going to go to the reports down, down below and we are choosing the balance sheet report. Tab to the right and reports on down below. This time the profit loss, the P to the L, the income statement and scroll up top. We're going to do the range change, changing the date range. We're going to go from 010122, January 1st, 2022 to 123122, December 31st, 2022 and run it. And then I'm going to close the hamburger, tab to the left and then scroll up changing the range from 010122 to 123122 tab january to december 2022 run it to refresh it close the hamburger that's the setup we do every time going to the tab to the left and then hitting the drop down we've been focusing in on the customer side of things the sales cycle the revenue cycle noting it will change depending on the type of industry that we are in or it will be di different for different companies in other words the easiest cycle you might have is if you're just getting money from like youtube or gig work or amazon and it's coming from the platform you might use bank feeds to simply deposit it with the use of in essence a deposit form so if you have that type of business and you're you're recording your sales transactions you'll be basically generating deposit forms through the bank feed. The other way you might ha have things set up is you might have a cash register type of situation, which would be a cash based system, but not one where you can wait till something clears the bank. In that case, you would be making the sales receipts at the point of sale. You would typically have some internal control. So you would want to be tying out your sales records to the cash register, for example, and then make the deposit in our system using the deposit form in such a way that it'll be grouped in the same format that will be shown on the bank statements so that we can reconcile and we could fit the bank feeds in that kind of area as well. We'll talk about that more uh, in shortly. And then we've been focusing in on the full service accrual system, which is the invoice. So if you're in a type of business where you have to do the work first and then invoice the client, then the invoice increases the accounts receivable. Then we would expect to receive the payment from the customer. We could record that receipt of the payment directly into the checking account, which in essence would be like a deposit using the receipt payment form like a deposit form, or we might put it into undeposited funds and then deposit it uh, into the bank. And then we would have to think about how the bank feeds are going to fit into that if we're using those and how the bank reconciliation will work in that scenario. So let's run through that scenario again, and then we'll end up at the end of the cycle. So we'll do the full accrual cycle, ending up at the final stage, which is of course money increasing our checking account on the sales cycle of things. So let's, let's first start off with an invoice. We'll make a couple different invoices so we can see some of the issues that could happen when we go through the, this full process into the depositing side of the money. So let's start with AAA. I'm just making up AAA again. So we've closed up the prior presentation. So we're going to start over every time with fresh data. I'm not going to put any email address. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because we've seen it in the past. And I'm just going to say this is a service item. Let's make it service one. I'm just going to say, well, let's add a new item. I'm going to say new item. And then we're going to add a service item. I'm just going to call it service one item. Copy that and description. I'll say it's for $230, whatever. 
and it's going to go to the service account. I'm not going to deal with the sales tax, no sales tax, turning that off and then done and save and close. And so let's say that we had say two of those that comes out to 460. What's this going to do? It's going to increase the accounts receivable because it's an invoice by the 460. The other side is going to go to sales and that's it. Let's hit the drop down again. And I'm going to say instead of save and close, I'm going to say save and new and do another transaction. So another transaction, let's say this is for BBB tab, setting up that one. And this one, we're going to say same service item we're selling service item one, and I'll sell one of them this time for 230. This also is going to increase the accounts receivable other side going to the sales. Let's save it and close it this time. Save and close. Check it out on our financial statements balance sheet first. I'm going to refresh it and then I'm going to go into the accounts receivable. And in the AR scrolling down, we've got the AAA, the BBB, there's the 460, there's the 230. Scrolling back up, then I can go back and let's go to the income statement, profit and loss and scroll down. And so now we've got the uh, services here going into that item. There's the services. Scrolling back up and back to our report. Let's go back to the first tab. Now let's make actually one more. I'm going to do one more invoice and let's make it for CCC this time. You might have guessed for CCC and then save it and then down here we'll call it service item and let's say we sell three of these for ccc and same thing so i'll save it and close it now of course we would then track that and expect to be paid on those items we could track those in the sales area that we talked about in a prior presentation by looking all the at all the sales transactions and sorting them possibly by the open uh, open invoices, for example, could close this out, open items. So there's those three. We can go to the invoices this way and look for the invoices. We can go to the customers and look for the items with the open invoices here. There's AAA, BB, and CCC. The point is that we're going to be receiving a payment on it uh, in, the, in the next step. So notice if I go to the receive payment, and we saw the receive payment last time, it connects to the invoice. So the receive payment's gonna decrease the accounts receivable and record the other side to some kind of cash account. Normally we go to undeposited funds. Now we're focusing in, in on the deposit side this time. So just note that you could put this directly into the checking account, which would make the receive payment basically like a deposit type form. So let's just do that to see what it looks like in the sub ledger. Now you would only want to do this if you, this payment is going to be hitting your bank account in the same dollar amount, meaning you're not grouping it with any other payments because um, for like cash or, or credit card groupings. And that would happen if you got like an electronic transfer for that exact amount or like a check. So we're going to save it and close it. And let's just see what that looks like. Save and close. So this is not exactly a deposit form, but it in essence functionality is the same thing. I'm going to run the report again, go into my checking account and let's see what that one looks like scrolling down in our data. So there's the AAA payment. Uh, notice that it's in here. It's increase in the checking account, but it's not a deposit. Now, the reason I point that out is because when you sort your data, if you filter your data, notice that the checking account has a many different kinds of transactions in it. It's often the case that you might want to try to sort your data by increases and decreases. And if you have to include the payments as like a deposit, it's one more thing you kind of have to think about. I kind of like to have all the deposits either be or increases be either deposit type transactions or, uh, or uh, transfers. So that's one thing to kind of consider, but you should be able to tie this amount out to your bank feeds so you could connect the bank feeds if you have them turned on to to this amount because when it goes to the bank you can basically tie it out here so it should still work as long as you don't have a grouping kind of problem if i go into that 
then that goes into my my receive payment, which functionality kind of worked like a deposit form. Okay, closing that back out, scrolling back up, and there was that. The other side of it went to the accounts receivable. If I go into the AR, we can see the accounts receivable goes up and then down for that amount. Now the other two, let's let's assume that we're going to use the other method for the other two and put them into undeposited funds and then deposit them. And we'll talk about why to do that. So let's go to this one. Let's go to BBB. Let's say we just receive payment for this one. And I'm going to say BBB 222. I'm going to say this time I'm going to put it into undeposited funds. That's going to be a clearing account, a grouping account. It's not going directly into our checking account yet because I have an issue. One or a couple reasons you could be. One, I have an issue with groupings to make sure I group it in my checking account in the proper way that it's going to show up on the bank statement. And two, maybe I just like to see all my checking account to have an actual deposit form for the increases instead of having the receive payment form. So I'm going to save and close. And then the other one was that owed us money was CCC receive payment. And so I'll do the same thing here. It's going to go to undeposited funds. So let's save and close that. So now those two items went into undeposited funds. Let's check that out. Go into my tab to the right. And I'm going to go to the run report. And if I go into my, my uh, undeposited funds, there's this clearing account. Now note, this is, is basically a cash account, which you would expect to be up here in the checking account. It's down here because it's not functionality working in the same way as a checking account. You're not connected to bank feeds and everything. But this is basically cash that you're holding onto or don't want to put directly into your checking account until you group it in the proper format. And when you put it into the checking account, you want to do it in such a way that it'll tie out to the bank, which you can match with the use of the bank feeds or uh, with the bank reconciliation process. So, so that undeposited fund was impacted with that last transaction. So here are those two. And then if I go back on up, the other side went to the accounts receivable went down and it went into undeposited funds. So, okay. So now we're going to make the deposit into the checking account with a deposit form. Now note when you, when you think about the deposit form, if I hit the plus button, you can see it's actually over here on the right hand side. It's not in the customer area. You would think that basically it's part of the customer cycle, the sales cycle, but there are times when you might get a deposit that's not coming from a customer, such as, for example, you, the owner, puts money into the company. You want to make sure that that gets recorded not as revenue. <laughs> and then you might get a loan, for example, which might be a deposit that's not going through the customer cycle. But hopefully most of the deposits are coming through, you know, the, the customer cycle. So if you're going to be entering like like a deposit that's going through undeposited funds so anytime i'm entering a deposit that is going to be going through this account of undeposited funds then i'm going to want to use this deposit form generally that's the general rule because it'll have another little item within it to basically group those deposits together we'll see in a second if you have another kind of deposit such as a such as a deposit that's coming from you the owner or from the bank or then and it's not tied to this grouping issue you might just go right into the check register so the check register could be the easiest way to enter a deposit or the bank feeds right the bank feeds can come through if you don't have an issue and you can record the transactions with a bank feed but for now we're going to assume that the deposit we're looking at these deposits that make up that that 2982.52 in undeposited funds so let's open the bank deposit form and you can see that right here there's the 298252 that's the amount in undeposited funds these are the transactions right here that make up that amount that are coming through from either the receive payments or the sales receipts which are like the credit which are like the the cash register type of transactions so now we're able to say okay i'm going to take these two items right here because i'm going to deposit those two items together into the system and that's going to be the purpose of this because why would i do that because now it's going to show up on the bank statement because i physically deposited let's say these two cash 
at the same time or these two credit card transactions got grouped together when they hit the bank account i want them to show up on my system in the checking account as 920 not as 230 and 690 because i will if they're two separate amounts i won't be able to reconcile either with the bank feeds or with the or with the uh the bank reconciliation or at least not easily i'll have to do added work so that's the point so what's this going to do it's going to be a checking account so it's going to be increasing the checking account you could choose a savings account or multiple checking accounts here's the date that we would have tags if applicable and now we're ticking these off now if it was some other kind of thing meaning like i was putting money into the system then i can do the receive from here and just give the account the account might be simply going into like an equity account my investment account if i put the money in or a loan payable so i'll talk more about that in a second let's record this save and close so this is a deposit form so it would do what you would expect it's going to be increasing the checking account so if i go into the checking account we're going to say okay i would have an increase to the checking account of the deposit so there's the 920 notice it's in there as 920 not the two separate amounts if i go into that amount it takes us back into the source document of these two items being checked off right there 920 closing that back out scrolling up to the top back to my report the other side is in undeposited funds let's run it again i don't think i refreshed it it's in undeposited funds, which isn't yet down to zero because it has some other items in it. But the undeposited funds is gonna go up and then it's go, gonna go down. And notice here, you're sh it shows you the, the detail. So it's, and that allows you to kind of tick and tie. So it's kind of nice that it shows you the increases and the decreases so you can kind of uh, tick and tie out the amounts here. So there's undeposited funds. It should go up and then it should go back down. Okay. So then if I go back to the to the first tab, the other ways that you might have a deposit is you the owner might put money into the business. So if if I if I was to I could do that with a deposit form, hitting the drop down, go into a deposit, and I could say instead of checking off one of these items, I'm just gonna say I'm not gonna put a receive from it because it's from me. I can put the owner and I can put some kind of equity account would be the the point here. So let's say their owner's equity let's say it would be like owner owner uh owner investment and i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna say that's gonna be an equity account owner investment and there we go so i set it up hopefully i set that up as an equity account and then you can say the payment was one thousand dollars or something like that payment method payment one thousand dollars and, and the other way that you might get a deposit is a loan, loan payable, loan payable. And you get, let's say $2,000. So we'll put, so we might just enter a transaction into the system thusly, and you can use these items down below to do that. You want to make sure that if you're getting, if you're the mon one putting money in, or if you got a loan, you didn't record these deposits to an income account. Otherwise, you're going to overstate your income. And if you have income taxes, you're going to be paying taxes on the money you got from a loan or investment, which isn't good. So if I record that, then, of course, I go to my balance sheet. I've got an increase in the checking account. So the checking account should go up by uh, those those amounts. There's the deposit. I put it in a, as a lump sum. And the other side is not going to the income statement but instead it's going to the owner investment account and the loan payable account that we increased. So that's the other way we can enter a deposit. Now, oftentimes if I go to the first tab, the other way you can enter a deposit that sometimes is faster or more intuitive to some people, if you're entering like a lot of deposits from a bank statement or something is to go to the register, which you can find by hitting the carrot here. We can go down to the accounting and I'm going to see your chart of accounts, close the carrot. Now, now the register is something we usually think about with the checking account, but you have a register for every kind of balance sheet account. The income statement accounts do not because they're a different kind of account. So I could think about it as increases or decreases to a register. So if I go into a register, for example, 
I've got my drop down forms right here. Check, deposit, sales receipt, that, 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 that. I could choose a deposit. And then I can say that this is gonna be whatever. I'll, I'll just make a deposit of, of $5,000. Other side going to loan payable again, just to practice loan payable. And then if I record that, notice if I go into the detail on it, it's still a deposit form. So it's just a quicker, kind of easier way possibly to enter a deposit. So if you're entering a lot of transactions, if I go into it, it's still just a deposit form and you can see it populated down here. So a lot of times when you have a quick transaction field, like the register here, it will still not default to a journal entry, but a deposit form. And you're even selecting in essence, a deposit form just in a, in a quicker or a little bit different layout for the deposit. And that's the same with the bank feeds. So lastly, let's think about bank feeds, which under the accounting view is under the banking. And then on the bank feeds, if I close, if I close up the hamburger, if you're in like a gig work situation and you've got the receive items. Now note, if you're not in a gig work situation, you'd have to match up your, the money that you received to like the invoice or to the receive payment or to the sales receipt uh, or to the deposit. You'd have to see where the, where it's going to match up. But if you're just going to record a deposit and then just record it as income, cause it's gig work. Like it's, you got it from YouTube or something like that. And that's how you're going to run your system because you're in a fairly simplified kind of accounting system due to the industry you're in. Then you could take the description, add the payee, for example, and then you could, you could add uh, the category, which would be some kind of income account. Typically, if it's coming from a customer, so I could say new, I'm just going to call it an income account. I'm going to say this is going to be just income test account and save it. And then, and so now you've got your same data. Now, once again, it's going to basically record a deposit because this is a bank fee. So it's increasing. That's what bank feeds have. They have increases or decreases to the checking account, but the format looks a little bit different here. But when you go back into it, it'll just be a deposit. So once again, you've got the increase in the dollar amount that's given to you by the bank. You've got the date, which is basically, which is given to you by the bank. And then you're adding the payee, which hopefully you can find from the bank memo or description. And then you are adding the account based on what you got the money for. And then I could add that. And if I was to go find that, let's just go to the income statement to find it. And the transaction was in 2023, apparently 01023 to 01, or let's say 123123, run it. And then, so there it is. So if I go into that amount and then there's, there it is. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that it's still put it in place as a deposit. So if you drill back down on it, then you're still going to find a deposit form. It's not going to be going to the, the, uh, the form of the bank feed. It's not going to show you the same format of the bank feed. So the takeaway from this, I'm going to close this back out is that if you hit the plus button up top, remember that these forms, QuickBooks wants to use these forms to create the transactions. And for good reason, oftentimes, because there's often other things that are designed to help facilitate the ease of the accounting system by using these types of forms. So we might have some quicker ways to do data input, such as the use of registers, such as the bank feeds, increases and decreases, but the, the system will probably still try to default to a form if there is a form that relates to the normal accounting transaction. And that's useful to know because it'll allow you to get basically drill back down on the, on the information from the financial statements and see what is actually happening as you, as you enter the data into the system. So the general rule is if there's a day to day kind of transaction, then one of these forms will be applied to it. If there's not a form that applies to it, because generally it's not a day to day transaction, you want to think is cash affected because if cash is affected, even if it's not a normal transaction, such as me, the owner putting money into the business or me getting a loan, those aren't day to day transactions. Then because cash is still affected, I might be able to use like a deposit form or if cash was going down a check form or expense form. If it's not a day to day transaction and 
cash isn't affected, that's when you might need to new use the journal entry. And that would be, for example, if I bought equipment and I financed the entire thing or something like that. Now that doesn't happen every day and cash isn't affected. Therefore, I can't use a default form generally and I'd have to go to the, to the journal entry. Remember that all these forms, every financial transaction you do makes a journal entry in that we have the double entry accounting system, two accounts are affected and so on but it's gonna be doing so with the use of the forms because that's how the system is designed to work. And then you only default to actually a journal entry entering with debits and credits if there's no other form <laughs> that we can use. Okay, so now let's hit the drop down on the cog and switch to a business view and just see where some of the stuff is located under the business view. So the home page, the get things done page on the left was here we still got the plus button up top that's where we have the invoice and the receive payment we've been working in the get paid area which is the sales cycle the revenue cycle where we have the get paid information we've got the customers sorting our invoices here is where we went we have our invoices uh, that was sorted our items and then we also had all the sales transactions which are in a different area which is the banking or bookkeeping area and so that's under the transactions. You could sort all your sales transactions here. So we went into here possibly to find like our open invoices and so on. And then we also had our bank feed information, which you would think would be under banking, but no, it's also under the bookkeeping. Uh, and then you're gonna go to the transactions up top where it's like bookkeeping and then transactions. And then you're on the uh, bank transactions tab up top and then i'd have to close this out and then sometimes it does this on this test file it goes into there but then there's your uh, banking information so once again those two the two layouts are similar all you know same areas generally it's just where they're housed could change slightly